So I'd like to introduce uh, our panel on 2014 Press Freedoms. And uh, I'm going to hand it over to Francis Moriarty over at the Foreign Correspondents Club. And he's going to talk uh, a little bit about who our panelists are and uh, kick it off for the next uh, hour and 20 minutes. Thank you, Amy. Thank you all for, uh, for being here on a morning uh, hot and sticky and humid. And I think a lot of people would prefer to be out having yum cha. But you're here, and we really appreciate that. My name is Francis Moriarty. I'm a correspondent uh, governor at the Foreign Correspondents Club and founding chairman of the Press Freedom Committee there. This has been, uh, well, all times for the press are always precarious times. There's no really good time for the press worldwide, but I think the past uh, year or two has been particularly stressful no matter where you look. Uh, the media worldwide are under economic pressures, financial pressures, personal risk pressure. A member of the FCC was recently killed in Afghanistan, which certainly drew attention here to the, to the risks and danger. Um, military uh, pressures, as we can see in, with the junta in, in Bangkok now. Uh, political pressures of all sorts everywhere. Uh, one can even, in mentioning uh, military, I should think about the Al Jazeera uh, correspondents who were jailed in Egypt as well. Um, ownership pressures everywhere. Everywhere there are ownership pressures. Vested interests of all sorts. If you're doing your job, you're going to run up against vested interests. Self-imposed pressures, and that can include self-censorship, as well as corporate pressures. So to discuss these and, and, and many more issues, uh, and I should throw into that visa pressures as well, uh, moving from left to right, um, we have uh, Steve Herman from The Voice of America. Uh, we have Mike Forsyth from The New York Times. Uh, Joseph Wong, founder of the uh, uh, Independent Commentators Association here in Hong Kong and a former government official. And Matt Kian Ting uh, of Radio France International and former chairperson of the Hong Kong Journalists Association. So let's start with, with a wide view and, and, and work our way down to local issues. And Mike, let me, let me start with you, uh, having had experience with the Bloomberg and now the New York Times. Uh, how do you see these pressures? Um, I don't know if these work. Yeah, uh, I think um, you're absolutely right, Francis. Uh, um, and it's a shame that we're feeling these enormous pressures now because I think philosophically, I think the world solved these press freedom issues about 220, 230 years ago. Uh, a lot of press, press freedoms are enshrined uh, in the U.S. Constitution. They found their way into the U.N. Charter as well. Uh, and the U.S. had a big debate in the 1790s uh, with the Alien and Sedition Acts. Uh, and Hong Kong tried their own version of that, obviously, 10 years ago. It didn't quite work out. These issues have been discussed in past centuries, and it is, I think, a, a huge shame that we're facing these issues now. Um, I would like to narrow it down a little bit to China. I think. China, um, which is an enormously complicated country, poses an incredible, incredible challenge to press freedom around the world uh, in a way that the Soviet Union, another Leninist country of old, never could um, because of China's enormous, enormous financial clout, size of its economy, by some measures the biggest economy in the world. Clearly, by all measures, will someday, you know, in the next decade, be the biggest economy in the world. It applies that pressure. I felt it personally, which is why I'm on this panel. Uh, and it is, again, it is something that the other old superpower, the USSR, never could do. And so uh, I think that's the backdrop for the challenges we face. Um, and, you know, we as journalists need to be rather aggressive about pushing back at that because we are right. If you don't believe, you know, that there should be freedom of the press, then you, you shouldn't be here. Or if you are here, you're from the enemy camp and you're just trying to gather intelligence. We need to be very aggressive. We need to push back. If you're able to push back, if you're able to whistleblow, if you're able to make it public, then you have to do it. You have to do it. That's the only way it's going to get back. And that's how I feel. So that's, that's the backdrop we feel like. I want you to know that we welcome all the people who are here to report on what we're doing. Uh, I, I'm very glad to have, uh, have such individuals present. Mike, is China in some ways now the kind of uh, a perfect storm? where you have the right ideology, you have uh, the right economic strength, and also the right technological ability, because you have the great firewall of China, uh, where there never really quite was the, uh, uh, the same thing for the Soviet Union. They, they built real walls, but not firewalls. And, and I mean, when you, you've got to be careful comparing China to the Soviet Union. Obviously, they're profoundly different countries, not just economically. Uh, China's a far, far more open place. 
uh, than the Soviet Union ever was. And young Chinese people, many of them are here today, who I've been talking to, are actually, you know, very curious, somewhat rebellious, uh, and, and want to, you know, they, they are just striving to be, uh, you know, excellent journalists as well. And there's so many excellent journalists inside of China who are always pushing, you know, the limit. But yes, um, you know, obviously China is a perfect storm in some ways, you know, Francis, because it does have all these tools which it can use and does use. Uh, it works diplomatically. We just saw Norway backtracking on China. Norway, the richest country in the world per capita, country that does not need China. It's, it's got a gigantic sovereign wealth fund, but for some reason it thought salmon exports were, uh, you know, important, and now it's not, you know, it's spurning the Dalai Lama. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's, that's the extent of the power of China. And um, I'm not here to really criticize the Chinese. I'm here to criticize ourselves. You know, we need to be aware of the fact that this is the reality, and we need to make sure that we, as journalists, um, are aware of it and push back when we can and call it out you know, when it happens. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about the Bloomberg experience, Mike. Well, I'm sure it'll come up. I can't say a lot. Uh, you know, obviously that's not fair. I've just been teasing about it. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was fired from Bloomberg in November uh, over a story that was never published. Um, I was very fortunate uh, to, uh, to get uh, employed at the New York Times. Um, uh, if you want to read about it, uh, 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 I think Dimitri, who was a panelist later today, uh, wrote a really good story about it in November. Um, and also there was also a story in the New York Times about it. Uh, and I think they provide a very good backdrop for, for what happened um, there. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, uh, but, you know, I, like I said, I, I feel very strongly about this, you know, and for me, it's a much bigger story than Bloomberg. Um, it's a story about, uh, that's unprecedented, you know, a rise of a power that is Leninist, um, an extremely complex country uh, that, that uses its power. In, and, and we, as the rest of the world, we are susceptible to that. Um, it's an age we live in, you know. You call it Leninist, but the real issue that seemed to have been the red line was is, is digging into the wealth of ruling families and their scions. Right, yeah. And that's, that's the line that we crossed, the line that the Chinese government made very clear that we are not to cross. When you mix politics uh, and business, when you write about the assets of the leaders of China, that's an area that was made very clear to Bloomberg and the New York Times that we do not cross that. Uh, I think they even said, some of the officials, that we don't want you to write the story because we consider the story will affect social stability in China. Uh, it'll have a big impact. But, I mean, that doesn't work with a journalist who's like, well, that story's going to have a big impact. Well, obviously, we want to write it. And uh, it's a natural tendency for journalists. Uh, well, one of the terms that's used is often, uh, that we know all know, is princelings, uh, the children of the revolutionary heroes and their grandchildren or what have you. Uh, but there's a real royalty, uh, a less majesty uh, experience uh, in, in, in Thailand to go along with the military coup. And I know, Steve, you've got some thoughts on that. That should be, is it on? Should be on? Oh, okay, there we go. Yeah, I was just uh, you, thinking about Mike's comments, and it's absolutely true, as, as you may know, in Thailand we had um, uh, another coup. This is the uh, 13th out of uh, 19th coups since 1932. We have an army chief in charge who has taken all executive and legislative powers, abrogated the Constitution, except for the Article 2 dealing with uh, the powers of the king, and uh, the media is under censorship. There are literally soldiers in the newsrooms, and uh, we haven't had any um, direct uh, problems as foreign correspondents yet. A uh, little bit of intimidation statement by a, a deputy police chief yesterday, which is actually a very powerful position, general position, uh, saying that uh, the foreign media has been um, uh, potentially inciting the protests and there's going to be an investigation. Um, and even before all this, as Francis pointed out, there were these Les Majest laws which were really had a chilling effect not only on uh, the domestic media, of course, but also on international media. Foreign correspondents have been charged under that. Uh, we're, uh, the, the army chief, Prayut Chanocha, who has taken over, is a very strong uh, royalist 
uh, was head of a, um, a special brigade that reported directly to the palace, not in the military chain of command. He has made it very clear that he intends to strengthen these less majest laws. We also see these laws being used as an instrument uh, to go after um, all sorts of um, freedom of expression, not only journalists, not only foreign correspondents. So it, it, it is a, a very chilling time, and it, you sort of have an irony. As of today, there are, are more freedoms in Burma than there are in Thailand. You mentioned these laws that concern the royalty. For those who may not be familiar with them, could you describe a little bit what they are and what they can be what they can be used to cover? Well, what's written in the law and how it's applied are two different things. I'm sure that's an experience uh, you see all the time in China. And uh, basically, there can be uh, no criticism of uh, the, the royal family. Uh, in, but in reality, over the years, um, those who have just written about the subject, any time that anyone feels that uh, there's been some sort of offense because just raising the issue, for example, saying, well, maybe these Les Majest laws shouldn't be so strict, that can get you charged <laughs> under the law. So, and, and we have a judicial situation now in Thailand, this is also something to, to take into consideration, where uh, essentially the, the, the judiciary has been abolished and everything now for these sorts of charges uh, are fall under martial law martial courts and you can be tried uh, without a defense attorney and uh, with without any appeals process so it's it's a quite chilling in this particular case this this martial law imposition uh, they, they moved in on CNN and on uh, the BBC, et cetera, and stopped the broadcast. Right. For about a week uh, or more, uh, BBC, CNN, um, I think uh, NHK, uh, and some others were knocked off. I think CCTV was allowed to continue uh, broadcasting. But they're, they're back on most cable systems now. Uh, and also, uh, that, that also applied also to the domestic uh, broadcasters as well. Every channel was essentially just simulcasting Channel 5, the Army Channel, and uh, it would mostly for some days consisted of uh, a lot of um, martial and traditional music and the logo of the armed forces and um, a colonel coming on the air in reading decrees, basically announcing what the new laws in the country were. I mean, it, 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 was, it was surreal. It's, it's almost like something out of Latin America in the 1960s. And to see this happening in the, in the 21st century as a correspondent uh, and being there, it was, was really something that you know, I didn't expect to see again. When juntas or military uh, authorities or dictatorships, authoritarian regimes, want to consolidate their power and control it, one of the things they, they move on is opinion making. The, those in power want to be the ones who control people's thought processes and, and, and what public opinion is. Joseph Wong, let me ask you, you've been a government official, you and I have been on the opposite sides of the microphone on any number of occasions, uh, and, and now you've formed an independent uh, commentators association. I can recall before the handover when a, a famous opinion maker in Hong Kong, Albert Chang, often known as Daibon, spoke at the Foreign Correspondents Club. And he said then uh, that when the time came that the government wanted to move against people, it would move first against those who could create and shape public opinion. He himself was subsequently attacked by knife-wielding men in the parking lot of commercial radio. So you form this association of independent commentators let me make an assumption. You can shoot it down or verify it, whichever, whatever's the case. Did you form this association, those of you who, who came together to form it, because you felt you needed some sort of solidarity um, in response to this potential vulnerability? Um, not exactly in the way you described. Um, of course, uh, as a former government official, uh, it's certainly true uh, that any government wants to influence opinion. But we want to influence opinion uh, in a civilized way. Uh, I don't believe that the, the government uh, at that time had anything to do whatsoever with Albert Jiang's uh, incident. Not suggesting the government did, but that he um, was attacked. But 
the reason why I formed this, uh, or I, at least I, I, I helped to form this uh, independent community association, the first of its kind in Hong Kong, is because after my retirement, uh, for some reason, I, 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 I became uh, a political commentator, a current affairs commentator. And I certainly feel uh, rather strongly in the past year or so, that Hong Kong is in a very critical stage. That a, a lot of things happened in Hong Kong that people thought, oh, it would never happen in Hong Kong. Okay? Uh, uh, for example, uh, you have Kevin Lau attacked brutally. Uh, and Kevin Lau was a person everybody knew about. He was a gentleman in the press. So, uh, uh, and you see sort of official comments saying that you know, nothing to do with the press, you know. But I can't think of any reason uh, why uh, his attack got nothing to do with his work. You're referring to the comment by the commissioner of police who said we can't find any evidence so far that indicates this attack was uh, linked to his work as a journalist. Which was totally unnecessary. Of course, of course, the fact that he could not find any evidence uh, to anything doesn't mean that it could not be have an association. And it's logical to assume that if a journalist got brutally attacked, uh, uh, crippled, uh, and he has got nothing uh, in his private life uh, uh, to worry about, then of course the logical uh, uh, association must be it's related to his work. We'll get back to Kevin Lau in a few minutes and, and if yeah. we'll be seeing a video from him. But I want to ask you to expand more on why you say Hong Kong right now is facing a critical time. Uh, there's a lot of tension in Hong Kong. Uh, tension number one is that the, the government of Hong Kong is in a very weak position. Mm -hmm. It couldn't get a lot of things done. You, know, you see all these troubles in the Legislative Council. Okay? And when the government is in a weak position, naturally some people within or outside the government would blame it on the press, would blame it on the opinion uh, 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 leaders, you know, rightly or wrongly. That's, that's uh, tension number one. Tension number two, of course, the greatest debate in Hong Kong today is the uh, election of the, uh, the promised election of the chief executive by Universal Suffrage 2017. And uh, you, you have a group of people saying that, look, you know, if, uh, uh, if we don't have a really a genuine uh, free uh, Universal Suffrage, we're going to take some action such as Occupy Central and paralyze Hong Kong as a financial center. Now that is a great concern to uh, Hong Kong government and more so to the central government you know, because you know, they do not want Hong Kong to be, uh, if you like, an international focus uh, of, of, uh, of free election. Uh, tension number three, uh, although in the past, you, you of course, you don't expect uh, pro-Chinese enterprises uh, to go to Apple Daily <laughs> uh, and, and pay for advertisement, but now that in newspapers, uh, advertisements really uh, are placed on the basis of commercial uh, considerations. But this year, it was clear, uh, one of the papers I, 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 I write AM730, his boss openly admitted that suddenly uh, a, a group of sort of uh, pro or, or enterprises with Chinese connections uh, pull out the advertisements. Maybe as a, 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 for giving no reason, but perhaps just a signal that look, you know, uh, and this echoes Mike's point that economically, we can do a lot of things, you know, uh, uh, to make people fall in line. Uh, so it's under this general atmosphere that I feel uh, uh, that Hong Kong should really uh, at least continue to have uh, a group of commentators, independent in the sense that we are, we are not anti-China, uh, 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 as a matter of principle, 
uh, former government officials cannot be anti <laughs> anti China. We got a lot of, a lot of baggage. We we uh, we just want to preserve Hong Kong as it is. And one of the values of Hong Kong is freedom of expression, freedom of press, within which uh, uh, people can express independent, hopefully balanced views uh, uh, for the benefit of the society. You mentioned AM730. The publisher of that publication, that, that newspaper, was himself attacked. Uh, Attack in a sense that uh, uh, he drove a car, and and, and somebody uh, went there and sort of bash uh, the, the front of his car. Uh, uh, not to the same extent as uh, as Kevin. Again, nobody was caught. No reason was given. N nobody's ever caught when these things happen. No. Whether it was the case of Albert Chang, or whether it was the case of Lung Tin Wai, who was attacked in his office, um, one never knows the cause. But do we need to know the cause, Joseph Wong? Do we need to know the cause in order to reach the, the, the conclusion that these attacks have an effect on press freedom? It's not possible, uh, and I, I can understand the, 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 the uh, our police force, which has been rated as the best in, in, in the region, <laughs> not being able to, uh, to catch uh, the culprit, because normally these are done by professional hitmen. And you've got three, four layers up, you know. You never catch. Well, the, uh, the attacker uh, on Kevin now was caught, was caught. No doubt there's a public uh, 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 trial, uh, 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 but you never know who ordered it. Mm -hmm. uh, whether or not it will have an impact on press freedom really depends on uh, whether or not our journalists and uh, the Hong Kong people are prepared to stand up uh, say the piece and continue to do things and to speak up as, as we like. And after the Kevin Lau uh, attack, uh, with, um, and, and Mac can explain this later, we have got one of the largest demonstrations in Hong Kong, uh, uh, really uh, to stand up and, and, uh, and, and sort of criticize, condemn this incident. Uh, so I hope these things and the opinions which, which can continue to come out will, 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 will at least try to, uh, to safeguard Hong Kong's situation for as long as we like. You know. well, how do you see, before we go to the, the Kevin Lau case and, and to Mac Yen Ting, how, how do you see China, Beijing, or factions in Beijing seeking to influence and shape public opinion in Hong Kong? Oh, I, uh, uh, it, it's very clear. Uh, 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 that uh, first of all, as, as, as I say, any government will want to influence opinion. Uh, 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 China is no exception. Yeah, but how do they do it? Well, they can do it uh, in a lot of ways, okay. Uh, one of the most uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, obvious way to do it is, as Max said, to, to really make use of the enormous economic power. Uh, when you look at the uh, uh, media organization in Hong Kong, most of the media owners uh, uh, really have extensive business uh, 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 affiliations or investments in China. And to uh, a lot of them, uh, uh, the media arm perhaps is a very uh, uh, useful tool for the other businesses. Uh, so that's point number one. Point number two is, as I say, uh, uh, if uh, a message is put to uh, uh, a lot of Hong Kong uh, businesses that, look, you know, this uh, newspaper perhaps is not very friendly uh, to us, um, then of course, you know, uh, you may do things which is not entirely commercial, such as pulling out advertisements, you know. Uh, number three, of course, uh, a lot of people, including some opinion leaders, academics, uh, also maintain a uh, relationship with China, and through which they, they can get a lot of uh, 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 quote unquote exposures or, or the personal uh, 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 interests. Not, not in a sense corruption, but of course, uh, 
uh, in Chinese terms, quancy is a very important thing. Relationships. Uh, uh, so these are, of course, uh, part of China's united front tactics. Uh, uh, so these things, uh, uh, in a way, has been carrying on uh, for a long time. For those this year, particularly more aggressive. For those not familiar with United Front Tactics, that's basically uh, the philosophy, the ideology of the strategy of identifying who your opponents are and splitting them apart and picking them off one by one until you finally get yourself down to those who are uh, ineluctable and then you deal with them in, in some traditional fashion. Um, we, we do have, uh, we keep referring to Kevin Lau here and we do have a video from Kevin Lau. So Joseph, this might be a good occasion for us to listen to Kevin Lau himself. Now, for those of you who don't know Kevin Lau, Kevin was the editor of Ming Pao, which is one of the most respected uh, newspapers in Hong Kong. It's a very, uh, it's a newspaper traditionally for the intelligentsia, I think is a fair statement. Um, he himself is a graduate of Hong Kong U. He has a, a law degree from Hong Kong U. He has his PLCC, which allows you to act as a lawyer, uh, which he obtained. And he also has a law degree, a master's in law from the London School of Economics. Uh, so he is a, a quite uh, proficient fellow in, in a number of areas and personifies, I think, in some respects, his publication. He was shunted to the side uh, and to be replaced by someone who's coming in from uh, Malaysia or Singapore, I'm sorry, is it Singapore, Mac, is, uh, Malaysia? His replacement. Uh, uh, Malaysia. From Malaysia. And, uh, and that was itself quite controversial. Uh, but while he was uh, awaiting the arrival of his would-be successor, uh, Kevin was attacked on the streets by a knife-wielding person on the back of a motorcycle uh, and, uh, and s very seriously wounded, still recovering, will probably require further surgeries and is only trying to regain his ability to walk now with, with great effort. Uh, he was uh, chopped in the back, nearly killed within less than a centimeter probably of, of losing his life uh, and, and is struggling to, uh, to not be crippled. So with that as background, if we have that video ready to roll, let, let's hear from, uh, this exclusive uh, piece of video from okay. Kevin Lau. Uh, before I say, uh, start it, I'd uh, just like to say my name is AJ Liebenau from the JMSC. just want to say my team produced this video last Saturday of Kevin Lau, this video message. And uh, for you guys, you'll be the first ones to see it. But it will go up on the N3Con website later today at 2 o'clock. So here we go. <laughs> I would like to welcome all attendants to the conference. I want to express my sincere gratitude to everyone who filed an inquiry and expressed a concern. I want to let you know how I'm doing right now. I'm recovering. Uh, I can now walk about 15 minutes with the aid of uh, my elbow crutch and a pair of um, ankle foot of phosis, thanks to the concerted efforts of uh, all my doctors and therapists. But the road to recovery is still long and uncertain because um, uh, human nerves grow very slowly, just one millimeter each day. So it may take um, a year or even two years for my feet and toes to resume basic functionality. And if the nerve doesn't grow smoothly, I may have to uh, go through another surgical operation in the near future. I will know more about it in mid-June when I take a test. Right now, the criminal trial of the two suspected attackers in my case are about to take place, so I cannot comment on the case until it's over. But I would like to urge the Hong Kong police force to use every possible means to investigate and find out the mastermind behind the scene the person who ordered the attack on an innocent journalist in broad daylight. The people of Hong Kong look forward to progress being made, justice being done, and fear among journalists being removed. Finally, I would like to wish the conference a success. Well, Kevin Lau, there's a profile in Courage uh, right there. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I saw a video of him uh, attempting to walk using two crutches. 
And it's an absolute miracle to me to see him walking like that with one crutch now. It's, it's absolutely amazing. I think it speaks to many things, at least not least, his depth of character and personal strength. Mac Yen Ting, let me ask you, is this what happened to Kevin Lau? Is just some one-off thing that we should set aside? Or is this indicative of, of where things are in terms of press freedom in Hong Kong today? Well, definitely. I think it is a, is a, a trend on press freedom in Hong Kong. I cannot think of other reasons apart from journalistic work of what he did in Ming Pao that caused the attack. And supplement to what you said, although the uh, commissioner of police saying that he cannot say that it's definitely with, the, um, with his journalistic work, but I think the Secretary for Security have almost correct what he said in days uh, ago and saying that, that you know, um, the investigation, the direction of investigation definitely will include what the journalistic work he done. And after that, I don't see Andy, Andy Zhang come out and say again what he said before. So I think that is quite widely believed that it is um, an attack on, on him is equivalent to attack on press freedom. And this, we cannot let this thing go so easily. And probably because of the aggregate effort of the whole industry that the police have caught some suspect and put them in trial now. But as uh, Joseph and other believe, we don't see the, the mastermind behind will be caught. And this is the most important thing that we think the, the, we urge the police to do. Given what happened to Kevin and seeing this would, would make anybody think twice, do you get any sense that young student journalists or journalists who are, who are new to the field, entering the field, are having second thoughts about uh, their own situation in the future if they persist in being journalists? I think it is not the, gen, not the student who think twice. It is the mother or the parent of those students that, you know, always asking whether you are really wants to go into that particular industry. It is so dangerous. That was, I told by some student journalists. And I, see, and I saw that they are very brave, especially um, on, the, on, the, on the march we have on uh, the 2nd of March, I saw almost every journalism department in different universities have come out, have their own banner, and saying that you can't kill us all. And they have all other slogans to demonstrate their determination to be a journalist. So that might be a, a good sign in certain sense, un unless I hope they can tell their parents what, how important to you know, resist this attack and to stay in the, in the industry and safeguard press freedom. The Hong Kong Journalists Association is a registered union. That's, that's what you do. You represent them. And that includes working conditions, salaries, what have you. For Hong Kong journalists today, what is the, the financial position, what are, the, what are the pressures upon them, what's the salary like, better or worse than it was a decade ago? Well, you have an up and down. I think um, if you compare what I have 30 years ago when I first came into, into the industry, now it's much better. But it is not the, I think, the journalists deserve more. Especially, um, we have a, a better time in the mid-90s, but then we, uh, the salary uh, level have going down a bit since uh, probably 2000 or 2003, something like that. And now it, it goes up a bit better. But still, as I said, I think the journalists deserve more. We are not asking for luxury life like uh, we fell home. We are asking for a decent life so that we can do our job properly. Now we, the student, especially the first grad, are very enthusiastic to do their work, but life is life. We cannot ask P 
people just doing a job properly for enthusiasm. We need them to have a, a decent life so that they can carry out their job properly and in a more sustainable way. Well, Raphael Hoy is uh, now in court. He's the former chief secretary uh, uh, in, in Hong Kong, and he's up on corruption charges uh, along with a leading family of real estate developers. Uh, when you look at the situation for journalists in Hong Kong today and the pressures that are on them, is it really any, any worse than it might have been under the colonial period? And if so, how? Well, I think now is the darkest time of press freedom. In the past 30 years, I work in the industry. And uh, apart from lots of pressure we have mentioned in our annual report on freedom of expression, we saw a more fierce attack like uh, Kevin now. It is especially significant to us in the, in the backdrop of more and more frequent attack on journalists. We, we are talking about, you're talking about Lang Tin Wai, you're talking about Abba Jiang, and also uh, um, a, a, a lifestyle writer of Mu Yong Kong, Mu Yong Gentleman, which only happened almost a decade, once a decade. But now, in the year 2013, we have 18 cases. How can you imagine that? And most of them are happened in Hong Kong. And even in the past 12 months, I have a very rough calculation, there were, there were another six cases attacking on journalists. Okay. On such a more frequent background, the chop on Kevin now is more serious. And if we, especially the government as well as the police, do not take the matter seriously, I'm afraid that people just think, think, thinking, you know, attack on journalists uh, as well as attack on press freedom is a, a life, is a routine, and even they don't have to pay penalty for that. So. And that is one. And especially, we saw a very, you know, the, the pressure, the use of economical means to tame the media has been mounting up. And also, it has affected not just the Chinese affiliated enterprise or the Chinese enterprise, but the international brand names. And that is very dangerous. To us, as as somebody have said, China is on the rise economically, as well as their Chinese enterprise in in Hong Kong. Chinese government is like other government; they always trying to use economical means and other means to tame the media. But with you know insignificant investment in Hong Kong, they could not do it well. In 1984, sorry, in yeah, in 1984, there were only four percent of Chinese enterprise listed in Hong Kong stock market. And in 1997, when Hong Kong resumed, um, when China resumed Hong Kong sovereignty, that was the number jumped to 22%. And now, do you know how much is the number of Chinese enterprise and listed in Hong Kong stock market? Can anyone assume? 56%. And it has been last for several years already. It, it may come up to 55, 57, and now last year, at the end of last year, is 56.5%. So you can imagine, actually, they have got the leverage. And not just the Chinese enterprise, and even though um, those uh, international brand names that they would like to have a dip in Chinese market, and Chinese will tell you what their rules are. So we, why the Apple Daily came out and saying that um, they have been under boycott of advertiser. Actually, it had been a long time ago. Since the Apple Daily established in 1995, they never got the um, property tycoon's advertisement. That was long, and they, never, and they seldom came out talk about it, but this year, they came out and saying that they have suffered, uh, they have a very sudden pull out 
of advertisement of long-term advertisers. They didn't name the name, but I know who they are. They include International Bank and, and even the air, a very famous airline, the Hong Kong flag fair. So you can imagine, actually, the influence, the economical influence has been spread over, not just limited to Chinese enterprise or friendly cooperation of Chinese government. It has spread to international organization, which we think they could stay more independent. So I think it is time that we have to think of how to deal with this situation. Mike, let me ask you something. We've seen over the last several months in China a widening crackdown. It's been on lawyers, uh, it's been on human rights activists, it's been on NGO people, it's also been on journalists. Uh, at the moment, there are two mainland-born publishers who have publications in Hong Kong uh, who've just been uh, taken into custody uh, recently in, in, in Shenzhen. Uh, we have the uh, Vivian Wu, uh, uh, who's a former two-time winner in the Human Rights Press Awards here in Hong Kong, who's been taken into custody in China. Gao Yu, uh, a famous dissident and writer who was a guest speaker at the Human Rights Press Awards here in Hong Kong, which are co-sponsored by the Journalists Association, the FCC, and Amnesty International, uh, also in custody. The list goes on. Do you think this is just nervousness running up to June 4th, or is this something else? Is that mic working? Can I? Try this one. Um, you know, one of the things about being a political journalist in China is it makes you very humble, I think. Um, you start out early and you think you know all the answers. And then as the years go by, you realize you're a complete idiot and you don't know the answers. So I don't know what's behind this. I do know that it started way before the run-up to June 4th. Uh, this you know, was starting more in 2013. Um, not that it's never gone away, you know, but there does seem to be anecdotally, and we could probably you know, graph this graphically as well, you know, measurable increase uh, in, in that kind of activity. Um, you know, what is behind it? I, I just don't know. Um, you know, there's lots of theories out there. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the theories being that um, the central government in China wants to uh, push forward its economic reforms. And in order to do that, um, it needs to make sure it shores up its support in the party. Therefore, it's cracking heads. Uh, you know, I think there's a, a long piece in Foreign Affairs that just came out that's talking about this dual, this dual theory. I mean, you know, that's a possibility as well. Um, it's so hard to really know, you know what's going on. I, I think when, when the, the president came in, the new president, Xi Jinping, there was a lot of optimism. There always is from foreign journalists. We always wish China the best, and we always wish the new leaders the best. Uh, you know, we all, we all love China, and you know, we're panda huggers. Um, and uh, so it, it certainly didn't turn out that way. Uh, you know, there wasn't, you know, even though you know, the president's father uh, was kind of a known you know, uh, moderate, I guess if you call it that, tough word to use, uh, but uh, it, it certainly is happening. Maybe what we'll need to look at is uh, now that June 4th has passed, uh, you know, you know there are, there's some evidence that some of these people are being released, uh, but if, they're, if most of them are released, uh, if this goes away and we don't see more reports of this, um, then maybe we can ascribe it uh, to the run-up to June 4th. But we'll just have to see. Well, like governments, large governments anywhere, China seeks to influence opinion about it around the world. Uh, through through various means, let me ask you: um, in in Thailand, what what role, quietly or not so quietly, is is China playing vis-a-vis -vis Thailand? Well, there's been some significance attached to a meeting between the junta and some Chinese officials last week. Um, I think it remains to be seen uh, just how significant that is. Sim something similar happened after the 2006 coup. Uh, obviously, uh, China will uh, attempt to move into a any vacuum, um, but uh, you mentioned foreign affairs in the current uh, print edition. There's also dueling articles between uh, two experts on, you know, just how 
uh, aggressive China is 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 trying to be in 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 this uh, role of uh, assertive diplomacy. Uh, I I'm not reading too much into that right now. I think that um, the General Prayut and others at the top of the military perhaps looked at China with some envy, seeing how easy it is in China to regulate uh, uh, the domestic media, social media. That's something else uh, where we're starting to see some crackdowns, threats of Facebook and Line and uh, Twitter possibly being um, shut off at some point. Something else I think I was remiss in not mentioning before uh, about the, um, the, the military's uh, reaction uh, after the coup is that they have summoned some 300 to 400 people uh, to turn themselves in. Uh, and usually they're being held for a week, going through some sort of um, psychological uh, uh, psyops, not we don't have any reports of torture, then they sign a statement saying that they will not be involved in political activity and won't leave the country. In one case at the Foreign Correspondence Club in Bangkok, the education minister of the deposed government was having a news conference and soldiers came in and literally hauled him out in front of reporters. So I think as, a, as opposed to China sometimes where they don't like cameras around when they do stuff like that, the, the military in Thailand so far has, has shown no hesitation to say, hey, you speak out like this, uh, you're going to be taken away. We have four people here who make their living asking people questions. Um, let me ask if you have questions of one another before we move over to the audience and take some questions from them. Any? No? Yeah? Well, what? 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 Shyness suddenly strikes these public people. Um, Probably questions out in the audience. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I see a, a hand up there from a gentleman. So let's go to, that's the first hand I saw. So let's uh, ask him. Please identify yourself if you would. Hi, I'm Paul Chun with the Associated Press and also the president for AAJA. Thank you for um, coming and talking about this very important panel. I just want to take a step back from China and Hong Kong and really want to get your sense of opinion in terms of what about other countries like Singapore, um, South Korea, and Japan, you know, has, you know, Thailand is taking a page from China in some way in terms of controlling the media. Are we at a critical juncture at this point where you could see other government in Asia taking the same page in China? And is freedom of the press in Asia at a critical juncture that is being jeopardized? Uh, short answer, I think it would be very easy to say yes. It's a bit of a paradox because on one hand, it, it may be easier to control traditional media because there's licenses for broadcast in a lot of countries, licenses for newspapers, and, and you can more easily uh, have overt censorship implemented. But then on with uh, social media, uh, is. China is another great example of the manpower that's required to uh, to shut down all the keywords and, and things like that. I, th I think it's I think it's a losing battle, but we're definitely seeing uh, movement in that direction. Uh, there's been quite a bit of uh, discussion about this new secrets bill in Japan, and Japan traditionally has been a, a bastion of uh, free press in the post World War II era. So if we're seeing these developments in places like Japan, uh, you know, what is the trend for, for other countries in the region? And, and then you talk about uh, places like um, uh, Singapore. Um, uh, there's definitely not much of a relaxation we've seen there in recent years. I was posted in South Korea for several years. I did a story about this, and, and a lot of people may not know that even in the Republic of Korea, which is a uh, democracy, that uh, there are all sorts of laws that are used regularly to go after um, people on social media and in the mainstream media, especially regarding uh, discussion about the DPRK, North Korea, uh, including in some cases people who have put up sarcastic and satirical pictures on uh, Twitter and Facebook uh, have been arrested just for that. So if you really do examine in, in a lot of these countries that are considered uh, democracies, there are still significant issues in, in some countries such as Japan where there's new cause for concern. 
just point out there that the satire and parody are two areas where the Hong Kong government has suddenly felt the need uh, to legislate. Uh, Mac, I, th I think you had a comment. Yeah, I just want to add to his uh, questions. Actually, a few years ago, China, not China, actually, that is the Southeast Asian countries are talking about new authoritarianism. That is actually having model of China. But I would say it is it's much more difficult for the Southeast and Asian countries to follow the rule, the role of China. And possibly just saying, uh, Thailand may be envy of how China can do with the the, the, med the traditional media as well as the social media because they have a very gi gigantic economic power. And imagine, can you imagine any place in the world, even in Thailand or in Hong Kong, that you can shut down the whole mobile system to stop people from spreading around so-called rumor? And that was taken that had been taken place in Xinjiang just after the uh, July 5th in the riot in year 2009 they have shut down all these communications for I re somebody told me that is six months somebody told me that is ten months no matter how can you imagine that will happen in other countries I don't think so but the the way the Chinese government um, cracked down on freedom of expression and press freedom definitely will have some impact on other countries that they would like to follow as long as they can provide. So that is, um, that is dangerous and as my said, it is not the problem of China, it is the problem of us. How we should deal with that, how we should stood up, how, this, how all us like Laos stand up. If I could take just a little bit of that question. Uh, in Japan, the Foreign Correspondents Club there has decided uh, it needs to set up a press freedom group uh, to deal with their own issues. Uh, I know that in Korea, the constant state of tension between the North and South has a lot of uh, effects on what people say or don't say, what rumors they print or they don't print. Um, in Taiwan, you have a very active uh, and energetic press, but it is not without uh, economic pressures, as I think Jimmy Lai and Apple uh, could, could attest. Uh, they've been successful, but not successful in getting a TV station. And unquestionably, politics plays a role in all of that. The Philippines is one of the most dangerous places on the earth to be a journalist, uh, particularly, it seems, if you're a radio journalist. Uh, so looking around the region, uh, you, can, you can find issues almost anywhere. And should I n neglect saying Vietnam, uh, where they're cracking down very heavily, not, uh, well, there's not much of a free press there anyway, but they've been going after bloggers and, and, and trying to uh, you know, be, put them away. Uh, again, the question of, of who shapes public opinion, and does the public get a chance to shape its own opinion? Uh, I think that's one of the questions that, that we have. Uh, I saw a, a lady who had her hand up over here. Someone please give her a, a microphone. Oh, thank you so much. I'm a student in Shantou University, and as a student from mainland, um, actually our young generation, we kind of, we have VPN. We know the outer world. Some of us study abroad, and we know what's happening, even like the Tiananmen Square incident. But I've noticed, I'm sorry to make a generation here, but many of us don't care, you know. The, who so don't care? So a bit hard difficulty, middle class. Sorry, yeah. Middle class in China, or? Yeah, mainland. I'm okay, a mainland thank student. You. Okay, I just so, want to be sure. So I want to know that as an outsider's, you know, journalist of mainland society, why this kind of phenomenon, you know, what it sees in China? I think it's not a government issues anymore. And what do you think can solve this kind of problem? Well, we'll pass it to the panel. But I would say I don't think every person in China has access to VPN or knows how to use it. Uh, my own experience in China when there was a crackdown in Tibet was that someone, I won't, I won't say who he was, but he came to assist me. And we went through 18 VPNs, and each one successively, they managed to close down over a period of time until eventually they shut down CNN. And not only did they shut down CNN, they were able, when they restarted it, to selectively pick which shows, which statements, which whatever would allow back on, and other things just completely disappeared. And I, I won't even talk about what happened with my emails, but you may, you may all chip in here on, on her question. Um. I think you'd find that in a lot of countries, apathy. Um, you know, you could even 
loath as I am to compare China and the United States here, there's plenty of people in the United States who are apathetic about politics as well, who are much more concerned about their daily lives. And that's kind of a natural thing, right? So China's had this economic boom you know, over the last 30 years. People are trying to build their lives. Um, they know instinctively that politics and political discourse is not going to be something um, that's going to you know, really uh, get them ahead um, if, they, if, they, if they stick their nose out there. Uh, but uh, these things are not static. You know, well, there's so many young Chinese people who do know about the events, you know, 20 years ago. There's so many Chinese people who are care passionately about it. And there's so many working class people and middle class people who also are, you know, are very passionate about this. So these things can change really quickly, too. You know, watch Chinese GDP growth down, go down to 3% a year. And how many of those middle class people are going to be politically apathetic? You know, watch their housing price, you know, in this development, which they paid way too much money for, go down by 20 or 30 percent, and you watch them become politically active, it's already happening. You know, they, a lot of Chinese people are forming their own homeowners associations, which is this lowest form of self-government. It's creating a lot of headaches around China, but it's like the beginning of this, you know, politics grassroots at that level. So I think it's, um, I don't mean to say it's unfair. I mean, certainly there are, there's a lot of apathy in China. There's a lot of people who don't know about their events and history, and that's a shame, you know, to be a healthy, country, you need to embrace your history, you need to study your history, you need to criticize yourself. I think a lot of Chinese people know that. Um, and, you know, these things are not static. These things will change. Um, and, you know, and I just want to say also, you know, we don't want to present here the panel this cartoonish image of China as a completely closed press society. It's not, you know, obviously it's a very rich, dynamic, you know, media environment inside of China. And I want to say some of the most aggressive journalism being done about the Chinese government is actually being done inside of China by Chinese news organizations like Caixin um, and Taijing. Hu Shuli, so we just did a story in the New York Times about this financier Xiao Jianhua uh, um, on June 4th. That was our, one of our June 4th contributions. And uh, he was a Be Beijing a Peking University student in 1989. One of the seminal articles that we used to research that was this 2000 article by Tsai Jing when, when Hu Shuli was still at Tsai Jing called a Xie De Lunang. So it was about this organization, this takeover of this Shandong uh, company in 2006 by these private groups, one of which was Xiao Jianhua. He was behind it. And she got so close, when I say Hu Shuli, that the Tsai Jing reporters got so close to basically outing the son of a member of the Politburo Standing Committee in that article. I mean, they really pushed it. There are Zhou Yongkang coverage, Tsai Xin's Zhou Yongkang coverage, and many Chinese news organizations' coverage was very thorough. I think as Hong Kong journalists, if you're a Hong Kong journalist, you need to realize you are Chinese as well. And while press freedoms have been restricted, maybe, and we've, we've seen the video by Kevin Lau, we've seen you know, so many examples of Hong Kong journalists being uh, hurt, being harassed. We know there's self-censorship going on. We know there's blatant censorship going on. We know that companies are under enormous pressure to pull advertising. The two companies you didn't mention, the, 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 by the way, that pull from Apple Daily, if you read John Garneau's article in Foreign Policy a few days ago, uh, he mentioned two companies, HSBC and Standard Chartered, pulled their advertisements from Apple Daily. Um, that's what he said. He got responses from them. They didn't deny it, certainly. Uh, they said that they operate for commercial considerations, whatever that means. Anyway, um, the point I'm making is if you are a Hong Kong journalist or you're an aspiring Hong Kong journalist, you, despite the problems we're talking about here, have an enormous responsibility to push as hard as you possibly can because you have so much more freedom here than the mainland journalists do. You have so much more scope to push. And to be quite honest, I'm not seeing that push as hard in Hong Kong you're not seeing the Taishin quality articles about the financing of journalists from the Hong Kong papers. Why did not the South China Morning Post, why are they following up on their wonderful article about um, uh, He Jintao, who's um, He Guochang's son? Uh, they did a great article, and their Tiananmen coverage was amazing. The logical next step is to look into the finances of He Jintao, He Guochang's. He Guochang is a Politburo Standing Committee member, or was. Why are not the Hong Kong journalists pushing this issue really hard? Why is it that the New York Times and then formerly Bloomberg, why are we doing these stories when you as Chinese people 
are far more talented than we are as foreigners. It's, it takes me twice as long, five times as long to do this research. You know, I can read Chinese, I can speak Chinese, but it takes me longer to do it. You guys are the insiders. So please, while there are restrictions here, uh, and they are amazing. I was spent eight years in China. I came here. This place is amazing, despite the problems. Hong Kong is a bastion of freedom in Asia, far more free than that other little island country to the south that's at two degrees north latitude. Uh, far more free than that, uh, with an amazing civil society that Mac talked about. Uh, you know, that protest after Kevin Lau's chopping was just, I, I cried. I mean, it was just so beautiful. Hong Kong civil society is so healthy. Uh, it is so rich. It is so civil. Um, and it has a lesson for all the world. So I think, I know I'm preaching here, but I think there's, you know, as Hong Kong journalists, while there is repression, you need to push hard. You need to be the center for excellence for these investigations, I think, which really get at the center of what it means, you know, in the, to be a, alive in the 21st century. You need to write on the nexus of its politics and, and business in China because it's just affecting so many things. Uh, the environment. Why is the environment so bad in China? Well, this is one of the reasons why. Why is the wealth gap in, so high in China? This is one of the reasons why. Uh, because of this incredible accumulation of wealth on the, on the part of the leaders and the people with Guanxi. And it's affecting Hong Kong. And so I would hope that more people in Hong Kong really push their editors. If they come back at you and say no, if you're in a position where you can out them and whistleblow, please do. I know that's not something everybody can do. You've got, a, you've got families, you've got a job, you need to stay employed. That's not something you can do all the time. But as you know, foot soldiers for press freedom, that's what we need to do. You know, we need to do everything we can. And people in Hong Kong are blessed uh, in many ways uh, you know, with the ability to really be the leaders of China journalism. Remember, Hong Kong is part of China. It's your country. So uh, you, know, you need to take your position, um, your, your, your great privilege of being a resident of Hong Kong and I will, uh, I'll stop my preaching there. Sorry as, about that. As, as the microphone passes over, <laughs> as the microphone passes over, let me point out that the two people I mentioned earlier who were arrested and taken into custody in Samjian were two people publishing individual publications, two different publications in Hong Kong, seeking to get out uh, rumors and information from inside the factions of China. Uh, so the the risk can leapfrog uh, the Samjian River. Hey, you, you had a footnote, please. Just a footnote. I, uh, I preface my comments by saying I'm sort of an ABC specialist, meaning Asia but China. Uh, I, I think to be uh, objective, we do have to note, especially in Thailand right now with the coup, uh, in South Korea and in Japan, if you look at social media, uh, there's a lot of commentary on there that is very nationalistic and pro-authoritarianism. There are people that will attack us online for uh, writing stories about the crackdowns. And that is very notable in, in Thailand. There's a significant percentage of the middle class population that supports this coup. So to, in, the, in the interest of objectivity, I think we also have to point that out. And uh, in, in China, obviously, we see all sorts of comments uh, online as well. We could do a whole other panel on some of the politics inside the missing Malaysian airplane and that whole search. Uh, that would be an interesting, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, Joseph, you had a comment. Yeah, I, I just want to uh, really uh, say something after Mike has made this very excellent uh, <laughs> preaching, <laughs> if, I say, if I say so. Uh, um, I always think that one should not look at Hong Kong and China as us and them, okay? Uh, uh, given my background, I always regard that we are all one family. What we fight for in Hong Kong is something which we believe is good for China. Uh, China, if you look at Chinese history, China has always played a very big role in the modernization of China. Uh, in, in bringing in a lot of quote-unquote universal values into, into China. And the, the, the greatest uh, uh, value in one country, two systems, 
is not the economic, the continued economic prosperity of Hong Kong. One can never guarantee that the place will forever be prosperous. The greatest value of one country, two systems is to let Hong Kong continue to be some sort of a beacon for the development of China into a really respectable world power. And when we talk about freedom in Hong Kong, we can really not have freedom if we do not have press freedom. If people don't know what's going on in Hong Kong, how can, how can you be a free person? And if we do not have free you know, freedom of the, of, the, of the press, you do not have people who can express views, maybe views which the government doesn't like at the time, other people don't like at the time, but the views which may of some value, views which are balanced, views which can influence people uh, in certain direction. Now, if we lose all that, Hong Kong will lose its value to China. And I do believe that there is a lot of people in China, even within the Chinese government, who doesn't want Hong Kong to be just a Samjan. Maybe still economic prosperous, but stripped of all the soft powers and stripped of all the very important values, which a lot of people in China, uh, even within the government, look to. And I think that is very important. It's something which we always want to reflect, and it's something which, given my background, uh, I want to do for my grandchildren in Hong Kong. Difficult to do what you want for your grandchildren if you don't have access to information and a right to uh, possess one's own history. But that's uh, perhaps another topic. Mac, you, you had a comment. Yes, I'm uh, just echoing uh, Joseph Wong that actually, um, my feeling, I, I remember 10 years ago, more than uh, 11 years ago, when I was interviewed by a, a, a colleague and saying that, you know, the position of Hong Kong, and I'm always saying that Hong Kong should be internationalized rather than Chinalized. But that was the policy of Hong Kong government. We, Hong Kong government always talking about integration with China, and now we have found that more and more China practice has been infiltrated to Hong Kong, which I think it is really a shame. And I hope very much that the Hong Kong government can really treasure the value of Hong Kong and stood Hong Kong as the internationalized city that China should be follow us to be short, to be followed with, and so that they can be internationalized and became a, a, a really international city, not we Hong Kong looking inward to the hinterland and saying that it, it seems that we have to follow the rule of China, looking at the the Guanxi and more and more um, rampant in Hong Kong, and even you know the. Um, the corruption, all this kind of thing has been infiltrated to Hong Kong so much that to the extent that we felt the core value of Hong Kong has been um, diminished gradually. That was what my worry are. More hands. I see, I'll go with Dorian Weisenhaus first right here. Dorian Weisenhaus, JMSC at Hong Kong U. Um, I want to uh, uh, compliment everyone for all the various points that you uh, say to the students. Uh, to can you get that girls. microphone closer to your mouth, Doreen? Yeah. Can you hear this? Is it turned on now? Okay. Um, but I do want to follow up with a comment that Mike said um, about how there is seems to be a lot more press freedom here in Hong Kong than in mainland China. And he's absolutely right. It's part of what's built into the legal infrastructure. I teach media law and, and write about media law developments uh, here in Hong Kong. Uh, one thing um, I would like to add on to advice to journalists is to not only 
follow on the political issues and the economic issues, but also on the legal issues. Um, that there are from time to time developments, uh, laws that are, might be proposed. For example, the Hong Kong government is looking at new privacy laws, what kind of impact that might have on press freedom. Uh, there is a strong infrastructure, but there also are potential problems that may rise. And so even though it might seem to be a little bit more difficult to understand and to follow, that I would advocate um, that, uh, that journalists follow those developments as well. I, I mean, it, we do. We do. Uh, obviously, last year, the Hong Kong government proposed some real restrictions on uh, some of the property uh, databases, company databases. Yes. Yes. And there was a strong pushback by journalists. Yes. Uh, right. We wouldn't have been able to do the Xi Jinping story at Bloomberg. And I still use a we at Bloomberg because we had a, such a wonderful team there, many of them still there. But uh, we couldn't have done that story. We couldn't have found Xi Jinping's niece's villa on, in Repulse Bay without those records, without right. access to them. There was a strong pushback. So I think right. people, I mean, we are very aware of. No, laws. no, no, I understand that, but what I'm saying is that um, there are, thanks to efforts by these pushbacks, by the various journalist organizations and by journalists covering that, it's just I'm advocating, as you advocated, that there should be more stories, that there be uh, continued attention to these issues in the future. And yes, Doreen, one of the I things that educators can do in the legal field, and I say this constructively, is, is try to create even more really good court reporters who understand yeah. these issues and, and, and who dig into them. There's recently... Yeah. Uh, a, a libel yep. case yep. involving, uh, I think it was Lee Ka-shing, yep. and the decision in that case may have rolled back uh, one of the defenses for libel. So I've not seen hardly anything written about that, yep. but that's a case that is out there. Mac, I think yep. you had a comment. Yes, um, yep. I think well, when we're talking about the legal structure, we are talking about two things. One is passively, what of those infringement of press freedom, uh, legal um, suggestions, but on the other hand, you know, like uh, Mike said, we have uh, a very good work uh, to ward off the change of the company ordinance in the company research, something like that. And, and we know that there will be a, a new law proposal might be coming that is about stocking that we have to another fight probably. And most important, we need to have progressively asking the government to liberalize the, um, the legal environment. We are, I'm talking here about the access to information law. When, om, when almost 90 countries in the world have access to information law, and even mainland have one, which although it is not very perfect, but still they have one. And yet Hong Kong do not have a law in this regard. I think it is a shame. And I think we need to do more to push the government to enact such a, a legislation to allow every people in the community to access to a public archive. Of course, journalists like us will be benefit, but most of all, the beneficiary will be you. So I think we need more to uh, we we need more effort in this regard to do this. I actually during my lobbying of government officials, even the ombudsman. He told me that they, they have very little submission been given to them during the uh, public consultation. And it seems that the public are not really love it or they don't feel the so, so need of it. So I, I know that it is true that everyone are taking more about their own life. But when these things um, and important things comes to our uh, scope of radar, I, I wish we take more initiative to get what we deserve. Some governments are also more clever than others. Um, the stalking law that's being brought up again was brought up more than a decade ago and comes back around. The company's ordinance that you referred to, the government has withdrawn it, but it has not put it away. It has shelved it, and I use shelved in the British sense. It's just temporarily up on the shelf and could be brought back in some form eventually. Uh, so it's just, it's, it's behind the screen right now, but it could reemerge as a character at any point. Um, and, uh, and we have no legislated, as you point out, no, no legislated statutory right to access information, nor do we have an archive law uh, in Hong Kong. Um, I'll take the gentleman in the white t-shirt right there first. Hi, my name is John Grobler. I'm uh, a reporter from Africa, Namibia. Um, I would like to, just briefly, if I may, just you know, reframe um, this debate because 
what China does has a major impact in the rest of the world, especially in Africa, and, uh, in terms of the pursuit of uh, raw resources. Um, since the collapse of communism 30 years ago, there's been a you know, sort of a silent debate out there, you know, communists lost and you know, capitalism won. Um, what's happening in Africa is that the Chinese model, which is still the communist one, is finding huge appeal. And it is um, undermining um, the freedoms and the democracy that we've been able to establish because you know, from the outside or for those who are you know, responsible for running our country, you know, it seems that the communist model or the Chinese, the Beijing model to be precise, uh, is looking increasingly attractive. It's a centralizing of power. And it's not, I beg to differ, it's not Leninist, it's Stalinist. Um, it's a centralizing of power. Uh, and we're seeing it ex increasingly emerge in places like Angola, DRC, uh, especially the resource-rich countries. So, um, what I would like to urge the reporters here in, in Hong Kong is to do is um, what you need to do is rephrase this debate by accentuating the positives of Hong Kong um, and especially the rule of law. That is what makes a difference out there in terms of democracy or you know something approaching that. Just is, is there a question in there with the statement? There's, there's a question coming. Um, I basically came over to look into if I could find more information uh, on Zhu Yong Kang's case. Uh, I hope I pronounce it correctly because that is very closely tied to what I'm investigating back home. And I'm, I wonder why we don't see more of this in, in the local, in, in Hong Kong prison. I've been scanning the papers and anything online that I could get on uh, my hands on, and there's very little. Now why is that? I'm, I'm not sure that I actually. I do not know the exact answer, but I can guess. One of the reasons is that the turnover rate of the of journalists in Hong Kong is too high. Um, when I first entered the industry, probably five to six years, you see a new generation. But now, probably one to two years, you can see all the new faces around in the press conferences with such junior experience. Do you think they can do such complicated investigative story? Of course, no. And one of the contributors of this phenomenon is the boss. When France is asking the um, salary situation, I think that we deserve more. Exactly. One of the reasons of the, um, the, ter the high turnover rate is the um, uh, the, the not up to standard salary in, of journalists in Hong Kong, which we have fight for several years. And the other reason is the problem of self censorship. You have, when, although more and more experienced journalists have been replaced by junior staff, but yet there are still some experienced journalists in the, in the media outlets. But I think to a certain extent, they, they don't want to touch on such uh, sensical and co-sensitive stories. Um, as Mike said, it is really a shame for Hong Kong journalists not to do more in this regard. And we have experienced different cases uh, that the, the management or even or the, super, the supervisors of us do not want to touch on those on human rights. Uh, some human rights bit story uh, reporter will, will tell me that actually their boss tell them not to do so many human, human rights stories. And if you're talking about um, the so-called the, the power struggle of uh, the, the leadership. And I can quote you a very explicit example. Remember Willie Lam, the, uh, a very experienced Chinese correspondent in SCMP, South China Morning Post, when he wrote an article on the power struggle of the Chinese leader many years ago. And he was confronted by his boss, the owner of the newspaper, who wrote a letter, so-called to the op-ed, criticizing his story. 
saying that it is almost saying that it's nonsense, you should not report that kind of things. And he arguing that I also have freedom of expression. I just express my will. And he, and he seems he forgot that he, is, well, he was the boss of that newspaper. And then finally, Willie Lam was sidelined and, and, and one year later, he quit himself and worked for another media. That there were other examples like this taken place. I learned that some, re some editors has been asked to fill in the headline which drawn out by the chief editor at the last moment because it was about the former president Jiang Zemin. So you can imagine after experience, this kind of bad experience, you know what to do. And that was the sources of self-censorship. And this self-censorship may jeopardize press freedom to a large extent, especially when Chinese government have more say and more influence on Hong Kong media. And sometimes senior reporters lose their jobs. Uh, let me say we've only got a few minutes left. And I want to get as many questions in as possible. So avoid the statements. Make your statement as, question as short as you can. I'm going to go th maybe three questions, and we'll try to answer them in, in one go to make the time efficient. So make your question really short, this lady right here. Hi, my name's Jenny. I'm from Taipei. I cover politics for the Wall Street Journal there. Uh, my question is, in Taiwan, there's actually not a whole lot of problem with press freedom. The problem is press credibility. And so um, you have a group of readers and audience who actually don't know how to hold journalism or, or media responsible. So my question is, how do you turn the tie? How One question. I'm going I'm to hold you right there. We've got so many people. Press credibility in Taiwan. Uh, this person right over here who's had her hand up for a long time. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm a student at Journalism and Media Center at HAU, actually. So from a young student point of view, what, from your experience, like uh, from of Mr. Forsyth and Ms. Mack in a, in the media, how should a young journalist work smartly under such pressure from maybe your boss, maybe the politics and everything? So, what's your advice on that? Yeah. How to work smartly in this situation? Uh, there's two, and there's a, a lady up in the back. Uh, hi, I'm Sally. I'm a manager newly working in Hong Kong. Uh, I want to ask, how does the big increase of Chinese comp enterprises invested in Hong Kong market influence the media? Can you raise some specific examples? Thank you. Chinese influence in Hong Kong, so uh, in Hong Kong businesses uh, and, and affecting stories. Uh, let's, let's take the last one first. Mike, Chinese businesses, how do you think they're affecting things? Yeah, I, I think uh, Joseph and uh, Mac would probably be able to answer this better, but we mentioned a few you know, in our talks, you know, the, the incredible pressure on advertising, uh, uh, one by one they die. Yeah, I, I mean we've we've mentioned many examples, you know, over the course of our talks, but I mean many advertising pulling out of controversial papers or papers that push the limit, you know, like like Apple Daily. Um, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of examples of that. That's one way uh, that that pressure uh, is is being manifested. Publications also get purchased and then closed down. Mac, do you have anything to add to that? Mike, microphone, please. Uh, uh, well, I think I had talked much you, you about the it, yeah. uh, commercial pressure. So what about the question about uh, the Taiwan and the okay. rambunctious <laughs> press in Taiwan? Yeah, I I always envy the press freedom enjoyed by our colleagues in our counterparts in Taiwan, but the problem is the, the concept of rule of law in, um, in Taiwan is much lower than Hong Kong. And also, I think the, um, the competition is in, in Taiwan is too fierce for the code of ethics to step in. I once in, in Taiwan asking why the marriage, why the wedding of uh, uh, celebrities in, in, in film industry being the top headline during the election of president <laughs> in Taiwan. And they, and they told me that actually they are, they are fighting for not digital, I think much more smaller percentage of the, of the, uh, of the race. And I think as you, as you said, 
I, I also feel that it is it's really a, a problem of the, um, the press there. The credibility can only be established by journalists who abide by ethical standard. And if they don't regard it as a, a treasure, then no one can help. As, as a matter of fact, the, comment, the, the watching dog of media is much active in Taiwan than in Hong Kong. And I, and I wonder very much that why still the um, credibility of our counterparts in Taiwan is a little bit low. And even I myself, I have to, I have to read newspaper from different camps so that I might, I, I only say I might, it's not a definite that I can see the, the more com complete picture of the events. And to the student who's saying that how can you be uh, more smart, I think the only way is that you, you must be more knowing more about the industry, the background, and also more critical, asking to yourself, why your boss telling you to cover this, not that one? You know, we, to journalists, we always say that we must reach between the lines, not just report what people say, but, but think of what he didn't say. I think that is, in, in I, short words. <laughs> a, a, a good place to end there, and I hope that if somebody uh, who's interested in the law wants to uh, organize something to look at uh, threats to press freedom around the region, uh, libel laws and the libel laws in different jurisdictions and how they can are used or can be used or potentially could be used uh, would be would be something to look forward to as well. I think we could we could all use something like that. Uh, with that, I want to say, Matt Kinting, Joseph Wong, Mike Forsyth and Steve Herman. Thank you very much for your valuable contributions and, and making this, I think, an extremely interesting and I hope useful panel. And thank you all of you for being here. Thank you so much. And I'd like to uh, thank also Francis Moriarty. Of course, he is uh, the chairman of the FCC Press Freedom Committee. So a round of applause for Francis as well. Thank you very much.